coffee. Coffee now! There shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth, distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. One man, one microphone, one mission. One message. True News, the only newscast reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And now for the most powerful hour on radio, here is End Time Newsman, Rick Wiles. This is True News, the news program that reports the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help us God. I'm Rick Wiles. Welcome to One Hour of uncensored news, views, and commentary. Radio host and home church pastor Chuck Chrismar will join me in about 10 minutes. Chuck has written a new book about the last days titled King of the Mountain. Well, let's get into the uh, top headlines today. The Los Angeles Times reported that professional staff members at the National Security Agency are furious with Barack Obama over the worsening surveillance scandal. Current and former U.S. intelligence officials told the L.A. newspaper that the Obama White House and the U.S. State Department signed off on the surveillance of telephone conversations of American allies. The L.A. Times said agency professionals are angry that the White House is claiming that Mr. O was unaware of the high-level eavesdropping on foreign leaders. They also said the surveillance was authorized by federal law and utilized at the White House. The growing scandal prompted U.S. Senator Dianne Feinstein to say she now opposes the surveillance of communications by heads of state and nations friendly to the USA. Uh, NSA sources told the L.A. Times that if President Obama and his top aides don't know the NSA was spying on allies, it means Mr. O doesn't read the intelligence briefings given to him every day. That's a good point. Italy's La Stampa newspaper reported that Russian diplomats handed out USB thumb drives as as gifts from Vladimir Putin to foreign diplomats and aides who attended last month's G20 summit. The thumb drives were were infected with a Trojan horse virus to collect data from computers where the thumb drives were inserted. The Russians also gave G20 diplomats mobile phone recharging devices, which were capable of secretly tapping into emails, text messages, and telephone calls. I'm laughing because I'm trying to, I'm trying to picture diplomats so stupid that uh, they would receive a gift from. A, a Russian diplomat saying, oh, this is from Vladimir Putin. He has a thumb drive and a, and a mobile phone charging device he'd like to give you. It's monogram with uh, Mr. Putin's uh, signature on it. You know, unbelievable, but uh, apparently uh, some of them received the gift. Uh, the Times of London reported that police in Beijing are investigating the possibility that Monday's car explosion in Tiananmen Square was carried out by Islamic suicide bombers. Five people were killed, 35 injured when the car drove into a busy lunchtime crowd and exploded into flames. Government Internet censors worked overtime to suppress video images taken by bystanders. Chinese police also warned eyewitnesses it is a crime to spread rumors in China. Great Britain will become the first non-Muslim nation to sell Sharia-compliant bonds. Prime Minister David Cameron told delegates attending the World Economic Forum in London today that the U.K. Treasury is preparing plans to issue a Sukkot bond valued at $321 million. A Sukkot bond is a Sharia-compliant investment vehicle. The pool of Islamic investments is expected to top $2 trillion next year. Prime Minister Cameron said it would be a mistake to miss the opportunity to encourage Islamic investments in Great Britain. He said the city of of London has the opportunity to rival Dubai 
as the capital of Sharia-compliant finance. Two Russian Tu-160 Blackjack strategic nuclear bombers flew from Russia. They crossed the Caribbean Sea on Monday and landed in Venezuela. The Russian nuclear bombers were on a combat training mission. Russian Airborne Assault Forces and Military Transport Aviation Units are conducting a military exercise in the Arctic near the North Pole. Russia plans to deploy combat troops in the Arctic by the year 2020. DARPA, the Pentagon's Research and Development Agency, is developing a brain implant for U.S. soldiers that can track and respond to brain signals in real time. It is part of Mr. O's brain initiative that he announced earlier this year. Known as Subnets, the system-based neurotechnology for emerging therapies project, seeks to use brain implants to reach the next level of neuropsychological treatment of U.S. soldiers. Subnets will allow Pentagon psychiatrists to record signs of mental illness in real time, deliver treatments to the brains of soldiers, and monitor the treatment's effectiveness. Subnets is modeled on deep brain stimulation, a surgical procedure that implants a brain pacemaker in the patient's skull to interfere with brain activity. The Pentagon is seeking volunteers who need neurological treatment. For disorders, DARPA expects to have the brain implants ready for U.S. soldiers by 2018 in order to track neuron activity and provide brain data. Not making this stuff up. This is for real. I'll let you uh, just try to comprehend what I just reported to you. Um, the U.S. government is spending more money fighting global warming than securing the border. 18 federal agencies spend a combined $22 billion per year fighting global warming, while uh, $12 billion is spent securing the borders. Meanwhile, Professor Mike Lockwood of Reading University in Great Britain is warning that the Northern Hemisphere is facing a new mini ice age with decades of severe Siberian winters and short, wet summers. He told BBC that the sun is quieting down at an unprecedented rapid rate. What is on board the mysterious barge floating off the coast of San Francisco? Last week, CBS affiliate KPIX Channel 5 News reported that the barge uh, with a four-story stack of containers is out in the open for all to see, but the barge's purpose is a mystery. The TV station learned that the barge is actually a floating marketing center for Google's new wearable computer known as Google Glass. A source inside the San Francisco Bay Conservation and Development Commission told the TV station that Google has spent millions of dollars on the mysterious barge project. Work on the project suddenly stopped weeks ago. The source said Google doesn't have a permit to float anything in the bay. A commission executive said Google will have to publicly define the purpose and operations of the barge before a permit can be issued. The West Coast barge is not the only mysterious vessel floated by Google. The Portland Press Herald reported a similar barge with shipping containers off the coast of Maine. An unconfirmed report claims Google has another mysterious barge floating off the coast of Connecticut. The Maine and San Francisco barges are both owned by a company called By and Large. The company leased a large section of the pier and uh, and also an abandoned U.S. Navy hangar from the Treasure Island Development Authority in San Francisco. The lease is reportedly costing the company, by and large, well, by and large, $100,000 per month. Nobody, however, will speak about the project. Google is silent. So, too, are the development officials in San Francisco and Maine. I need to take a short break. Uh, Pastor Chuck Chrismar will be here when I return to talk about who will be king of the mountain in the last days. And, uh, hey, I also want to remind you that uh, True News needs uh, your generous financial offering as we wrap up the month of October. Uh, we... Uh, 
We're falling a little short through the month, uh, but uh, the Lord will provide. There's no doubt in my mind. And uh, we will meet our goal before the week is out. Now, you can give online at truenews.com. PayPal users should uh, enter support at truenews.com. Uh, checks, money orders, foreign currencies, precious metals should be mailed to True News, Post Office Box 690069 in Vero Beach, Florida. Our zip code is 32969. We deeply appreciate your generous gifts. Uh, And um, we give thanks to God for all the partners who support this ministry. Uh, We uh, have a very low-key fundraising system here. We don't bombard you with letters and phone calls and and all kinds of things. We simply tell you at the end of the month that this is a ministry supported by the love gifts of the people who listen to the program. Okay, let's take a break. Uh, When I come back. Chuck Krismar will be here to talk about the king of the mountain in the last days. You're listening to True News. Reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ. You're listening to True News, the end time newscast. This is Max McLean. How do we benefit by following the teachings of Jesus? Listen to the Bible from Matthew 7. Therefore... Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, The streams rose, and the winds blew, and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. From Matthew 7, listen to the Bible. It's great for the soul. Hear more at RadioBible.org. You're listening to True News, the End Time Newscast. I'm Rick Wiles. Unlike the mainstream news media, we report the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help us, God. Pastor Chuck Krismeyer is with us today. Uh, He's not been on True News for a long, long time. Uh, Charles Krismeyer is an attorney. He is the founder of Save America Ministries. He's the host of the Viewpoint Radio Program, and he is the pastor of a Covenant Community Cell Church in Richmond, Virginia. Chuck is also the author of a number of theologically sound books, including Out of Egypt, Renewing the Soul of America, Seduction of the Saints, The Power of Hospitality, and The Secret of the Lord. His newest book is King of the Mountain, the Eternal Epic End Time Battle. His website is saveus.org. Chuck Chris Meyer, welcome back to True News. Well, Rick, it's like a wonderful reunion. Yes, it is. Been a long time. It has been too long, and uh, I've always enjoyed our time to chat together about the things that matter most. Uh, to each of us, and uh, the kingdom of God, and uh, this is a delight. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. uh, (laughs) I think uh, the uh, time has gone by so fast because both of us are so engrossed in in fulfilling the call call that God has put on our lives, and we're just uh, just going at it all all day long. In fact, it's happening so rapidly, uh, it's enough to make uh, your head spin, and it certainly makes time fly. Time flies, they say, when you're having so much fun. And I guess uh, amidst all the seriousness of our time, we can still enjoy ourselves, and we do find joy in uh, fulfilling what God's called us to do, don't we, Rick? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Well, Chuck, uh, all boys have played King of the Hill. Uh, The rougher the game, the better uh, it it was to play. Um, (laughs) Always a lot of fun when boys uh, get knocked down on their behinds and roll down the hill. So what does King of the Mountain have to do with the last days? Well, King of the Mountain is uh, just another way of expressing that uh, King of the Hill. Uh, There are two ways that it's often referred to, a game that 90% of the boys in the world have played at some point. And about a year and a half ago, uh, all of a sudden, the image of that game flashed up before my eyes, uh, in my mind. And uh, the moment that happened... The Lord spoke to my heart and said, Son, that is 
the view or the the way to understand the window through which you can understand 6,000 years of human history and what's happening and going to be happening in the next few years as we see uh, biblical prophecy being fulfilled. We see history and prophecy becoming congruent right before our eyes. And uh, all of a sudden, Rick, as I was considering those things, uh, it was as if uh, the whole history of the planet began to unfold uh, before me, and I could see how this theme, King of the Mountain, uh, actually ties it together, and in fact, it takes us before human history and takes us up uh, to the heavens where uh, God himself had created Lucifer, uh, the archangel who was the most uh, beautiful of all created beings, the anointed cherub that covereth, and uh, he got kind of uppity in his mind and in his heart because of his great beauty and his great wisdom and decided he could be equal with God. The Bible says that he actually walked on the fiery stones of the Mount of God in heaven. The fiery stones of the Mount of God in heaven. So Lucifer (laughs) was the first person to play King of the Hill. He was, and he's still playing it. That's the point. He didn't give up. He's still playing it. He was cast out of the Holy Mount, and along comes, uh, you know, God creates man in his image, and he gives man dominion in the earth. And uh, so Satan says, oh, you know, I'm cast out. Okay, I know how I am going to regain that position to become king of the mountain. And uh, so through mankind and the deception of mankind, he usurps the authority that God gives to man. And now Satan then, for 6,000 years, has been using that deceptive authority, uh, one kingdom after the other, to uh, uh, grab dominion over the earth. And now his time is short, and he is working triple time through the power brokers of this age, both geopolitical and religious, to uh, make his final bid to become king of the mountain, and there's only one mountain that matters to him, and that's the Temple Mount. You know, when when you <clears throat> reduce this to the simplest terms, and really all human history is, is, is one long procession, one continuous long procession of king of the hill. Because well, if, if you saw history, if you, if you saw human history from God's viewpoint, for 6,000 years he's watched one emperor, one king, one ruler after another. All uh, the way from Babylon to Egypt and, uh, and to uh, Persia to uh, uh, Rome, and then uh, on to our modern expressions of those through the resurrecting Ottoman Empire in Turkey, the resurrecting uh, Persian Empire through Iran, and then you have the uh, Russian Empire that's resurrecting after it was declared dead, and then you have the resurrected Roman Empire through the uniting Western world, and it's all happening right before our eyes, not to mention the uniting of the uh, Islamic world that believes under the mandate of the Quran that they are not only commanded to, but destined to rule the world as Islamic caliphate. So all of these things now are merging together, and they help us to understand the dynamics of what are taking place out there. Uh, and, and the reality is, as I have been on talk shows, Rick, across this country in the last five weeks since the book came out, and we're talking about these guys who are interviewing, all of a sudden it's like their eyes are being opened, and they're saying, wow, we haven't been able to connect these dots. It's like everything was disjointed, and now you're bringing perspective. You're helping us to understand the fullness of what is taking place. And I, I tell you, Rick, uh, it is, it's exciting, but it's also uh, exceedingly challenging because uh, we're facing a time in which mankind himself is arrogating himself against the word, will, and ways of the Creator, and in fact the whole of mankind largely is seeking to become king of the mountain and to cast the Creator out. Chuck, are, are doors opening up for you on, on secular commercial talk radio shows? Or are you doing well, primarily uh, Christian programs? No, up till now, what's interesting is I've done primarily uh, secular. 
And uh, some of those hosts have had uh, some measure of Christian background, but uh, it's been primarily secular. And what has been fascinating is they brought me back over and over again to talk about these issues in oh, just a matter of five weeks. And uh, it is, it, it's something that's shocking to me, uh, Rick. Uh, we haven't even begun, really, a, uh, a campaign of communicating within the broader Christian community. It's just now getting ready to begin. We had a television interview uh, down there in your neck of the woods, Florida, just uh, a week ago. And uh, that's going over the, uh, the country now on 30 different stations. And uh, there, that talk show host, the, the t- TV host, was just absolutely blown away by this book. The reason so. I was asking is, uh, Chuck, is I, you know, I, I believe the uh, religious broadcasting uh, and in the, the, you know, the uh, church world is doing a miserable job in reaching the unsaved with an understanding about what is happening in current events. I think there's a lot of unsaved people who, who know something is Something weird is going on. Things are not right, but they exactly. don't know. They don't know how to put their finger on it, figure it out. I mean, a, a couple of weeks ago, Susan and I and some some uh, guests were uh, having dinner in Vero Beach, and in the parking lot, as we went to the to our our automobile, we overheard people, you know, standing at the car next to us, talking about how strange things are in the world. Mm-hmm. And I wanted so much just to, you know, go over and get into the conversation and try to, you know, help them there. But, you know, we just, you know, for a few seconds there, we just, we heard part of their conversation. But you could tell they were like, hey, things aren't right. Things are, things are mm-hmm. weird. And, yeah. and I think, I think, uh, God is opening these doors for you. And I believe he'll open the doors for other people on commercial secular stations and, and various avenues of communication. Because people are hungry. They want to know. And by and large, the church world is just not rising to the occasion to to fill the need that people have right now for an understanding. Well, if ever there was a time, if ever there was a moment uh, where we can do that, it is now. Uh, just this last week, uh, Billy Graham came out. There was a uh, actually a lengthy article that came out talking about a release from Billy Gra- Dr. Billy Graham uh, who basically had stated, uh, we are in the end times. Brother, we're not waiting for them, we're in them. And uh, he said the best thing for us to do right now is to take the Bible in one hand and the news in the other and uh, present the truth of the Word of God the way you and I do it, Rick. And, uh, you know, I've been doing this for 20 years now. I don't know how long you've been doing it, but... Uh, we're in our uh, we 15th go, year of broadcasting. We, we go back a fur piece together And uh, we're in a season. We're in that season. Michelle Bachman uh, came out with a statement just uh, this last week that uh, we are in the end times. And uh, it it seems, in fact, Benjamin Netanyahu made a similar kind of statement that we are in prophetic times. And so there is this growing sense that, yes, indeed, uh, something dramatic is happening. Uh, People cannot connect the dots. They don't know what to do about it. They're, they're disconcerted in the spirit of their minds. And then when we can bring this kind of material to them and help them to understand, not so much from a standpoint of just uh, heavy preachment on them, but laying it out as this book does, uh, you know, as a former attorney, it, it kind of lays a foundation for me to be able to present evidence in a way that demands a verdict. All right. And, uh, uh, that's all right. what we've done. All right, Counselor. Uh, present your evidence. <laughs> All right, you've got you've got the floor. Present the evidence. <laughs> well, you know, uh, let me just first lay out that uh, the book is divided into three sections. Uh, the first has to do with the contest, uh, defining what this contest looks like in the battle for King of the Mountain, and it takes us back through again six thousand years of human history, and uh, particularly in biblical history. Uh, with uh, Israel, with Abraham, uh, God leading Abraham uh, to sacrifice his uh, son of promise, Isaac, on Mount Moriah. 
which actually God specifically chose, and Abraham, when he got to the place, knew it was the place that God had chosen. And there he offered up his son. God, uh, in the nick of time, offered, uh, presented a ram in lieu of Abraham's promised son, and uh, because of that, God was now freed because a man was willing in the earth to offer up that kind of sacrifice. God says, now I am free to offer up my eternal sacrifice uh, on this same mountain, uh, the holy mountain, which is now called the Temple Mount. And so <clears throat> we have the, the contest that's all laid out there in the first 14 chapters of the book. Then comes the seven chapters laying out the contestants. And this, when you get to the contestants, you need to, uh, you've already been in your chair, you might, you might have your seatbelt anchored, but now you need to put on a shoulder harness. And uh, as you move through that uh, section on the contestants, I warn people, you might have to put on a head restraint, because <laughs> the, the unveiling of what has been happening in our world using hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of uh, articles and uh, magazine articles from a wide variety of sources, not just in this country, but all over the world. And uh, it is so compelling that it leaves absolutely no wiggle room whatsoever to realize that these contestants, whether it be uh, the dragon versus the eagle, that is China versus the U.S., or whether it be, uh, be Russia versus the Pope, or the Vatican, uh, whether it be um, uh, the Mahdi versus the Messiah, that is, the Islamic Messiah versus the Biblical Messiah, there are seven of these uh, chapters showing the dramatic characters or, or power brokers, both religious and geopolitical, that are raising their head. And then you move into the final section called the Conquest. And in that section, there is a chapter called The Great Game. And I tell you, if, if uh, people only knew, if the leaders of our world only knew, if the leaders of Israel only knew, if uh, the leaders in our country only knew the extent of, of uh, oil and gas and their interrelationship to the fulfillment of biblical prophecy and what it's doing to compel the nations and draw them like a hook uh, in their jaw against Israel, uh, this chapter just completely unveils uh, the reality of that. It is shocking. And then finally realizing that the, uh, the ultimate battle is not just geopolitical for the Temple Mount, but is also, uh, on the spiritual side, is the battle for control and rulership over the heart and mind and soul of every man, woman, and child on the planet. So you've got these parallel tracks, the geopolitical and the spiritual, that are uh, tracking with each other and have been for 6,000 years and are now approaching the final culmination just before the second coming of Jesus Christ. Chuck, uh, last week... Uh, the Xinhua News Agency in Beijing published a, a biting, scathing editorial in which they called for a new world order mm -hmm. in a world that has been de-Americanized. In other words, a, a new world order where the United States doesn't have a place in the new world exactly. order. Um, many times when people uh, hear the phrase new world order, they, they have a concept in their mind of one monolithic uh, movement to rule the world. But what I've seen over the years is th the concept New World Order, actually, uh, there, there, are, there are many competing forces. You call them combatants. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a good uh, term for them because uh, there are many groups that know there is a, a New World Order coming. And they each have their own version of that new yeah. world order. We've exactly. got we've got the Freemason Illuminati group that has their version. Um, we've, the Vatican uh, knows that there's going to be a new world order. In uh, fact, Pope John Paul II and uh, Benedict XVI both called for a new world order. That's right. 
That's right. And uh, the Chinese are calling for a new world order. The the Islamists want a new world order. So, exactly. So is the phrase new world order doesn't mean the same to each of these groups. So they all know that there is coming a time when the world order is going to change and there will be a new king on the hill. Exactly. Russia's also called for a new world order. That's right. <laughs> so it is fascinating that the same kind of lingo is used but the implications and the meaning behind it. Uh, let me give you an illustration going back to the childhood game of King of the Mount or King of the Hill. You get one friend up on the hill, whether it's 10 feet high, 15 feet high, or whatever it is, and uh, these other friends, buddies, uh, are there, and uh, they don't just try to individually pull the guy down. They'll conspire together. They'll conspire together or confederate their forces in order to try to dislodge the guy who's standing on the hill. Well, why do they do that? Because in their minds, individually, they think that they're going to be the one to rule from the hill. But they will use the of uh, the power of the others in order to gain that ascendancy. It's exactly the same thing that's happening in our world today. And uh, uh, the Bible talks about this. It talks about uh, uh, political leaders using religious leaders, religious leaders using political leaders in order to gain the ascendancy to be the final ruler of King of the Mountain. And uh, I tell you, this is high drama at the OK Corral. Yes, it is. And I was just thinking about uh, the late Malachi Martin, the, <clears throat> the, the Vatican insider, the Catholic priest. Yeah. And uh, he he wrote in, in a book in the 1980s uh, that, that uh, the battle for a new world order at that time was between the, the, the Soviet Union, uh, the West, and the Vatican. Exactly. I mean, he, he openly said the Vatican was one of the contenders for the new world order. In fact, the book is called The Keys of This Blood. That's right. Uh, 750 pages, one of the most important books written in our time. And uh, he was bold in revealing that John Paul II was the ultimate geopolitical pope, that his primary thinking was not spiritual, but was geopolitical. And uh, he realized that, from his perspective, Russia was the primary opponent that the Vatican had to face as to who would rule the world. And uh, then he looked at the West uh, in a very different light with all of its uh, multinational corporations and so on. Uh, They were economic competitors. But he saw Russia in a very different light. And I'll tell you why I think that is. And I talk about that in the book. Uh, Russia has a 1,500-year heritage of prophecy uh, based on what is called Third Rome. And uh, people will say, what do you mean Third Rome? Where's Second Rome? We know about Rome and the Vatican, but what's Second Rome and then Third Rome? Well, here, here's the brief history of that. The Vatican and, and First Rome was the original Roman Catholic Church. And it was believed after a number of years that uh, it had become heretical. And so, ultimately, uh, the Catholic world was split, and Constantinople became the new head of the Eastern Catholic Church, uh, or you might say the Greek Orthodox Church. And uh, then, after the Greek Orthodox Church was established, and they had a dual papacy, each one of those popes, of the first Rome and the second Rome, excommunicated one another. Along then came the uh, Islamic world, and they came in and destroyed Constantinople. What happened at that point was that then all of the, the Christian emphasis and control and power that was in Constantinople was shifted to Moscow, believe it or not. And Moscow then became what was believed to be the epicenter of the true church in the world. Not the, not the Vatican, but Moscow. And out of that came uh, a prophecy that there would be th- 
uh, three Romes, that Russia was the third Rome, and there would never be another. Now you can understand why Russia and the Vatican are at absolute eternal and uh, unprecedented loggerheads right now. Have you have you noticed one uh, of them intends to rule the world? Chuck, have you have you ever noticed over the years that uh, the Pope never gets a visa uh, to Moscow? <laughs> He didn't want to have much to do with Russia, I mean, with Israel either, until a few years ago when they decided, hey, we're going to have to develop some friends there, otherwise mm-hmm. it's going to be difficult to rule from the Temple Mount. No, the reason I'm saying is, is that uh, Russia will not permit the Pope to, to come into the country. Exactly. In fact, uh, the Pope uh, extended a, an invitation to uh, the Metropolitan, that's what they call mm-hmm. the Archbishop of the, Greek, uh, of the Russian Orthodox Church, uh, to join with him to talk about uh, uh, merging the two together after the thousand-year Great Schism. And uh, the head of the Russian Orthodox Church said, uh, you'll do that on our invitation. And but, that invitation has not yet been extended. That's right. <laughs> you know, I, I, But I, I do have to give credit to the Russian Orthodox Church for taking uh-huh. a stand yeah. against Western decadence. Uh, well, that's true. A month or two ago, the, the patriarch of, of the Russian church said in a Sunday morning service in, in the cathedral in, in downtown Moscow, he said that America's embrace of homosexuality is a sure sign they, that the apocalypse is nearing. Mm-hmm. Yes, isn't he correct? He's absolutely correct. He's absolutely correct, because that's exactly what Jesus said, as it was in the days of Lot. So it will be just before the second coming of the Son of Man or Jesus Christ. Yeah, Chuck, so, in the nineteen, I think in the forties or fifties, there was a oh, I can't think of his name right now. I'm having a senior moment, um, uh, missionary to to uh, Russia, and um, he had a prophecy that that there would be a a powerful moving of the Holy Spirit out of Russia in the last days. Do you know well, anything about that? I'll... No, I, I I don't, but I do know that uh, uh, Orly Tate, Dr. Orly yes. Tate, is Russian, uh, and uh, she is not a Christian believer, but uh, she does feel very strongly that uh, she is standing in the gap for America mm-hmm. to protect against everything uh, that she saw in Russia and in the Ukraine. And uh, I have also had the opportunity to minister in Russian churches up in the Northeast. There's a, a quite a congregation of, of Russian churches there. And, uh, in fact, they've just asked me to come up again. Uh, and they have come here to establish, uh, uh, you know, not only religious freedom, but protection from government control. And now they believe that... Uh, their own families, their own children, are at greater risk here than they were in Russia. Because at least in Russia, they didn't have to face all of this iniquity. But here, it's iniquity running in the streets and in the schools, and it's stealing their children from their families. Yes, sir. Uh, Chuck, uh, in the past month or so, we have seen a profound change in the geopolitical balance of power in the Middle East. Mm-hmm. When Barack Obama uh, drew the line in the sand that he later declared that he never said regarding Syria, mm-hmm. uh, he didn't back it up, and Russia moved in. When mm-hmm. when Mr. Putin and Mr. Obama had a little meeting off the side of the uh, G20 summit, uh, within days, things shifted in the Mediterranean. The U.S. and the West withdrew all of the warships. Russia filled up the Mediterranean Sea with their warships. Um, Russia is in the driver's seat regarding Syria. The U.S. and the West are are on the sidelines, and and now we have um, we have the uh, Saudis that are furious with with the United States. They said last week they're cutting off diplomatic relations with the United States. That has a profound impact, uh, significant. Uh, connotation because of these the petrodollar so if the saudis end the relationship with the united states that ends the petrodollar now we're back talking about oil and gas um we've got um our 
you know, all of our allies are furious with the United States over the NSA spying. Mm-hmm. I, sometimes I wonder if Mr. Obama is uh, deliberately doing these things to weaken the United States so that another nation has a better chance at being king of the hill. Well, I don't know whether it's so that another nation has a better chance in that sense, but I do believe that he is intentionally weakening the United States. And I'll tell you the reason why I believe that and and what I I think is the goal. Uh, He knows, and those who have been calling for a Western New World Order, that is the uniting of the Western world, which I would call the resurrecting of the ancient Roman Empire, uh, <clears throat> those who believe that know that the U.S. is the final and ultimate power to resist and stand in the way of the fulfillment of that movement. Therefore, the U.S. must be brought down, its economy must be brought down, its power and uh, economic dominion and authority must be brought down so that we can be deemed to be equal with all the other nations. Now, lest we put too much on Barack Obama in this regard, we need to go back to 2007 when George W. Bush entered into a private and secret agreement uh, with Angela Merkel of Germany and Barroso of Spain, who at that time were heading up the European Union. And here's what he did. He entered into a pact that within seven years, the U.S. economy would be merged with the European Union economy. Chuck, you're one of the few guests I've had on this program that knows about this. Because nobody nobody talks about it, but I I know exactly. Because because it's deemed in political in in conservative circles, you just don't talk about somebody who you thought was a fair haired boy in your camp. That's right. But you're absolutely right. George Bush did sign this Atlantic Treaty, Uh, and I forget the exact name that they have for it. But I you know I you know I I just recall. I think it was called the transatlantic uh, whatever it yeah, was. Yeah, something like that, but uh, it was the merger of the European and American economies. All right, now let's look at that. That was in 2007, the latter part, as I recall, of 2007. Seven years from then leads us to the middle of next year. That's 2014. Rick, as I observe all of the machinations of the nation's the decisions, the directions, the promises, uh, the dreams, and so on, they are all congregated around the year 2015. All of them. Oh, wait, wait. Which wait a means, minute, Chuck. Wait, Chuck. You and I have now just for the benefit of, of this audience, okay, um, I want you to say one more time, you and I have not, we've not had a conversation for, what, several years? Yeah, it's been we, – we haven't talked at all for several years. That's right. We haven't had private phone calls. We haven't had emails. No, no letters, no emails, no nothing. That's right. Okay. You, you, you just said – you just said, uh, as Groucho Marx said, you just said the magic void. Okay. You said two, really? okay. 2015 mm-hmm. because you have no idea how many guests that I've had in the past year, both secular and spiritual, who say, when I look at everything – in my realm of expertise, I see, I see events coming together in 2015. Mm-hmm. Now, tell me why. Tell me what you see coming and why you see it happening in 2015. All right. Uh, for one thing, there are all of these various uh, agendas that are framed around the year 2015. Uh, whether in in America or whether in Europe, uh, around the world, everything seems to be framed around that fulcrum year, the end of the middle of 2014 through the end of 2015. Now, here is another reason why I I think that that may be significant. Jesus said that this generation shall not pass until all these things be fulfilled. He was speaking prophetically. There's always been a discussion, always been talk about what did he mean by this generation. Did he mean the generation that then was? 
Did he mean a generation? When would that generation start? When would it end? And what is a generation? Well, let's suppose that you were to take uh, the rebirth of Israel, which uh, many, most uh, uh, theologians believe was the trigger point, uh, the fulcrum point, uh, for the beginning of the fulfillment of, uh, of all end-time prophecy. And that was in uh, May 14, 1948. If you were to take, uh, let's, let's say, 25 years as one measure of a generation, we're way past that. Let's suppose you took 40 years, which is another way that people often measure a generation, from the movement from one family to the next level of family and so on. We're way past that. But what if you use 70 years? 70 years is the amount of time that the Bible allots to a man in the earth. Three score and ten, or if by reason of strength, uh, four score years. So 70 years. If you add 70 years to 1948, you get to 2018. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, if you subtract seven years... From 2018, you're back to 2011. And I believe that 2011 was the hyphen year of world history. It was the fulcrum point. It was the turning point in which everything would be accelerated from then. And halfway through that seven-year period is 2015. Chuck, several years ago, the Holy Spirit started uh, whispering to me, uh, new dark ages and um, th- that probably was 2010 2011 when I started hearing hearing new dark ages uh, in, in this year I, I have seen that phrase in in articles mm-hmm. by uh, various uh, commentators and economists and and uh, People who write newsletters, this this uh, this phrase, new dark age, or we're going into the dark age, is, is, is starting to pop up. Does that make any sense to you? Do you see um, do you see something up ahead that could be described as a new dark age? Well, I I have not used that term, mm-hmm. but uh, in practicality, the reality is yes. Uh, let me give you uh, one classic illustration as to why that would be. The world itself now has become Sodom and Gomorrah. The whole world has become Sodom and Gomorrah. And uh, uh, our president, or I call him our putative president, uh, our putative president has uh, uh, been the one who has catapulted the world more into the realm of the finality of Sodom and Gomorrah than any other single force in history. And what are the spiritual consequences for the United States of America to have that title hanging on? The, it? the spiritual consequences are uh, almost unspeakable because um, God judges, God judges such a, a, a wickedness with fire. Uh, that's what the Bible says, that the wickedness of Sodom was judged with fire. The prophet Jude, uh, there just before the book of Revelation, talks about the same thing, the wickedness of Sodom judged with fire, and uh, the practice and promotion of uh, sodomy, homosexuality, lesbianism, uh, all reflective of a reprobate mind, a mind that is absolutely and totally sold against God and elevating the creature over the Creator, uh, is, is so of, such an offense to the Creator himself that he cannot and will not let it go. And uh, I fear for the United States of America because that we have allowed, not only allowed, but we have actually elected and then re-elected someone that we knew had dedicated himself to advancing the cause of homosexuality, to remove all barriers. And not only that, Rick, but he has gone to Africa and threatened the leaders of Africa that if they do not submit to his will concerning the matter of uh, advancement of homosexuality without legal restrictions in Africa, that he will remove our aid from them. 
Now, I don't know how much more wickedly a man can, can, can conduct himself except to advance the cause of abortion as well. And he said that the very first thing that he would do when he entered office was to remove all uh, legal barriers to the advancement and use of American tax money to advance the cause of abortion worldwide. And that's exactly what he did. So now he has attacked uh, the creation order. He's attacked the sexual and marriage union. What more can he attack but the face of God himself. And he permits his uh, followers to refer to him as a God, as a Messiah. Exactly. In fact, in my book, and the book isn't all about Barack Obama, very little of it is about that, but I cite uh, uh, probably 20 uh, separate references to Barack Obama as the Messiah, uh, not only in this country but around the world, uh, we have never, ever, ever seen or experienced anything like this phenomenon in the history of the world. Uh, and it's all culminating, it's all converging at this amazing moment. It's like history and prophecy, all of these events are coming together, and indeed, it is ushering in a new dark age, so to speak. It is the age of the one who, con- who fr- was cast out of the Mount of God and is now uh, making his final bid to become king of the mountain, to rule this world from the Temple Mount, the Mount of God, and in addition to that, Rick, and this is what's really serious, the purpose of all that is to rule and reign over every single human being that God has created in his image, to cause them to bow and worship him as King of kings and Lord of lords. You know that the King of kings and Lord of lords, Yeshua, the Messiah, the Holy One of Israel, the Lord of glory, Jesus Christ, is going to return soon and very soon. And I tell you, the world has never, ever seen a conflagration like what is about to take place in our planet. Chuck, I'm, I'm inclined to, to believe that uh, the scripture that says uh, that uh, the Antichrist will go into the temple and declare himself as God, I, I'm inclined to believe that the temple is us. In the New Testament, we are the temple of God. And I believe, I believe the spirit of Antichrist is taking its seat in the temple, inside yep. human beings, declaring that he is God. I believe it's going to be a both-and experience. It is, both, it is both the rulership over mankind as the temple of God, and it's also going to be on the, the mount on terra firma that God chose to place his name there, the city of Jerusalem, the uh, Mount Zion, the Temple Mount, and let me tell you, Rick, did you know, I'm sure you do because you keep track of these things, but it was not very long ago. In fact, I have an article somewhere hanging out here. Oh, here it is right here. Uh, Israel National News, Arut Sheva, exclusive, a seat for the Pope at King David's tomb. An historic agreement has been drafted between Israel and the Vatican. The Israeli authorities have granted the Pope an official seat on Mount Zion in Jerusalem, where David and Solomon, Jewish kings of Judea, ruled. This is an enormous issue, they say. Now, why is this significant? Because, as you well know, the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah 9, 6, and 7 says, For unto us a child was born, unto us a son was given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there should be no end. And here is the significant part. Upon the throne of David, to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from this time forth and even forevermore. The Vatican knows that. And... This is the most precious thing that they have been able to gain dominion and control of 
so that the Pope, sitting as the vicar of Christ, now has been given authority to sit on the seat of David, representing the very place where the prophet said that Christ would rule and reign from. Chuck, uh, this is the ultimate usurping of spiritual authority, and I tell you, the level of wickedness that is happening is beyond the pale. And the Vatican now is using the coalescing Western world, the resurrecting Roman Empire, the New World Order of the Western world, using that to advance its position to gain dominion over Jerusalem and the Temple Mount. The, uh, the New World Order folk are using the Vatican to gain, use religion to gain dominion and authority uh, over the peoples, and together they are each using the other, prostituting their respective positions to gain dominion over the Temple Mount uh, from, for Christ him, from Christ himself. I, Chuck, words in, in, in are one, insignificant. In, words are incapable of describing the uh, incredible things that are taking place right now. Chuck, can you summarize in one minute what you believe is going to happen at the Temple Mount? I believe there's going to be a new temple built. Uh, there's a lot of argument about, uh, you know, uh, how that will happen, but I will tell you that the rabbis, the Sanhedrin, Jewish leadership, sent out a letter to 70 leaders of the world saying, you must come and help us rebuild the temple, but is the only way you'll ever have peace on earth. They believe that they must have a rebuilt temple. Now, whether you and I, as professing Christians, think that that's important or necessary is not the issue. They do, because they haven't received Yeshua as the Messiah. Therefore, they must have the temple. It is the closest thing to identity for a Jew that there is on this planet. And it is through that means that ultimately a compact or covenant or peace agreement is going to be entered into, I do believe that the temple offering a rebuilt temple is going to be the turning point that will allow or cause the Jewish people to give up all other precautions and enter into a so-called peace agreement, which the Bible calls a covenant with death that God himself will annul. But it is going to precipitate the final events of world history and uh, it's the battle for King of the Mountain. All right, and that's going to be the final word today. My guest, Pastor Chuck Krismeyer. The book is King of the Mountain, the eternal epic end-time battle. Chuck's website is saveus.org. The book is available at Amazon.com. Chuck, thank you. Good talking to you, my friend. Same here, Rick. Thank you so much. Bless you all. Well, yes, the high and mighty rulers of this world are in a life-and-death scramble to the top of the mountain to see who rules the world in the last days. But I feel sorry for them, because it will be in vain. Their new world order will not last long, and it will be ground into dust beneath the feet of our conquering Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The rulers of this world can have their temple mount in old Jerusalem. I wait for the mountain that St. John saw in the vision on the island of Patmos, The angel said to John, Come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Also, she had a great and high wall with 12 gates and 12 angels at the gates, and names written on them, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, three gates on the west. Now the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And he who talked with me had a gold reed to measure the city, its gates and its wall. The city is laid out as a square, its length is as great as its breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs, its length, breadth, and height are equal. That, my friend, is New Jerusalem. That's the Mount of God we desire.